Good afternoon, everybody's in mic, working okay? Great, uh, so I'm conscious of the fact that it's just before lunchtime, so please bear with me as, as best you can. Um, uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about the application of artificial intelligence to interrogate data for learning. It's more specifically the K-12 sector, so kindergarten uh, to year 12. Um, just by way of introduction to the sector, this is a maturity model that Intel Education uh, put together. The good folks at Intel very kindly did this work. And it just shows in three phases the technology adoption of uh, secondary schools and what tools they use and what phase it comes in. So you can see in the early stage technology adoption phase one, simple things like using Google to do some uh, research, pulling pictures, putting them into a presentation. Second phase is kind of specialist solutions, so classroom management tools, um, and that's where you get into your e-textbook creation. Uh, and the third phase is integration, so um, where you integrate uh, all of the different services uh, from across platforms to share insights with each other. Now, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we work in this space. So we work at the very kind of highest level of technology sophistication, why is it good? Because, gosh, we're awfully clever and we do great stuff with our data. Uh, why is it bad? Um, we have to find educational publishers who are willing to take that journey with us and have a sophisticated enough infrastructure to actually do something like adaptive learning. So uh, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, this is us. So here we are in uh, Dublin. Um, we're very fortunate in Dublin to be home to uh, Google, who I know have already spoken today, a lot of other technology companies, but it's really becoming a specialized hub for educational technology, and we're hoping, um, as perhaps Brexit unfolds, that may you, you improve. Uh, that was, I was really torn about whether or not to put that one in, but I'm keeping it. Um, and look, we've been doing all right the last couple of years. We launched uh, to the market uh, our first commercial product uh, with our partner, uh, three years ago, and we've been doing okay so far. Uh, my name is Diana McCray, I'm Head of Publishing Services, uh, so no questions about technology stacks. Just want to get that out there. Uh, or languages. Uh, so my role in the company is really to um, midwife these projects with our publishing partners. So we have these educational publishers, traditionally um, very uh, print-oriented, print-focused, uh, my job is to really bring in the technology, the artificial intelligence, the front-end design, the consultancy, and help them make the journey into adaptive learning. Um, now today, uh, applying machine learning to educational content to get actionable data. So I wanted to try and tell you guys a story today about three ways in which we interrogated a set of data and got really clear action points out of it. I'm conscious of the fact there aren't so many uh, in the room who work in the ed tech space, so I wanted to give you something that would hopefully be relatable enough uh, and, uh, and overcome the, the hunger that is almost certainly eating at you. So when I talk about assessment, this is really a piece of assessment content. So in education, um, you simply have a question, answer, solution piece. This is from one of our products that's live in Mexico. Assessment is incredibly important to adaptive learning because if we can't assess the ability of our students, we can't make recommendations about what they should do next, which is, after all, the business that we're in in adaptive learning. So we model uh, user experience across three different horizons. The first is the curriculum model. So how are the users actually navigating the course? Um, what are the most efficient routes that they should be taking to uh, achieve retention and improve learning outcomes. The second is the learner model. So that's the student record. What questions are they getting right? What are they getting wrong? How much time are they spending? Um, we also have some really nice uh, modeling decay modeling. So just because you got an A on something uh, last year doesn't mean you're still at an A level necessarily on that concept. If we don't have enough evidence to suggest that you are still an A, we can model that decay and recommend kind of interleave practice. Uh, chances are you've forgotten this. Maybe it's time to revise the specific area. And then the content model. Now, given that this is ContTech, I figured I'd probably focus on the third strand of this. So we also uh, analyze and interrogate content uh, performance in the educational space. Uh, all of this uh, goes into this very generic looking funnel. And it comes out as a recommendation for 
the student. So what should the student do next? Now, any good teacher since the dawn of time has been doing adaptive learning. So if you have any teacher who can recognize that some of the students are strong, sorry, I shouldn't, I'm weak, no, um, and in the middle, no. Uh, so any student who recognizes different students, so a teacher who recognizes students have different abilities is adapting learning. They tailor the content, they tailor the assessment. Technology just allows us to do it much more efficiently, agnostically of personality, um, and uh, at, at speed, and, and also scale. So the paradigm for adaptive learning is to give students content that is not so easy that they become bored, not so difficult, it's very Goldilocks this slide, so not so difficult that they experience anxiety, but it's somewhere in the middle. So when people are in flow stage, they are at the edge of their abilities, their retention is better, uh, their learning outcomes are better, they spend more time in the applications, so they learn more. So that's really the paradigm of personalized learning. Um, why would you bother doing all of this, right? It's a, it's a lot of effort to create these products. So these are just some of the figures about impact on learning. So in my world, uh, improved learning outcomes and retention are the metrics that are everybody's pursuing. So these are just some of the uh, uh, statistics about how we've improved um, ability of estimation and motivation detection. So today, the normal way that we do business is we partner with educational publishers, help them get products to market. So I'm gonna tell you a slightly different story, um, just because it was fun, and I think it's the content conference, may as well go for it. Um, we were approached by a Chinese publisher, very large Chinese publisher, uh, with an absolutely massive data set. So they had done everything right. They had authored the contents in structured XML. They had uh, uh, unique identifiers across their contents. They had fantastic databases of student records, uh, student profiles, teacher profiling, um, but they weren't quite sure what to do with this data. So they had all this mud, they needed somebody, hence the metaphor, it's a bit labored, I accept, but they need us to basically sift through all this massive data to try and find some interesting insights. So after, um, first thing we did was, this is a kind of a very simplistic overview of the types of data that they gave us. Gives the student ID, how long they spent working on the contents, the dates that they worked on it, their pass fail outcome, and then in terms of the content metadata, as I say, it was, nicely, it was all nicely structured and had an assigned difficulty level uh, written by you know, the content authors. Um, so after cleaning it up, so you have to take out all of the teacher records, the salespeople's records, um, the, the demo account records. Um, you also have to clean out all of the data uh, where you don't have a statistically relevant sample, right? So if we only have a hundred records of a question being attempted uh, or a piece of content being analyzed, that's not statistically relevant for us. So we would hold off on venturing any opinion on that until we get into much higher numbers. So the first thing we looked for was quality. So what, what content is really performing, what content is poor? To do this, we used um, discriminant strength for the question, right? So. A, a well-written piece of assessment has a healthy discriminant value and a green box. That's good. What it means is, as the ability of the student improves or increases, the likelihood of them passing the content also increases. So there's a direct correlation between how strong a student is and how likely they are to pass the concept. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, a diagram of a question that has zero discriminants. What that means is that this question, you could pass this if you were the best student, you could, sorry, you could fail this if you're the best student in the course, you could pass it if you were the worst, and everything in between. There's no correlation between student ability and actual outcomes on this content, on this question. So that means it has a low discriminant value. These are bad questions. When you're writing assessment, you should be able to distinguish between the wheat and the chaff. That's a well-written piece of content. If you fail to do that, you've got a problem. So the outcome of our analysis on the first horizon, quality, was 32% of the content had quality issues ranging from pretty bloody severe to, ah, you might want to have a look at this. Now, 
Editors and authors are expensive. I'm sure you all know that, uh, and deservedly so, in case any of you are editors or authors. Um, but uh, so what you want is you want very focused insights about the performance of your content. And this is one of the ways in which we help this uh, partner. These are your problem areas. Go get them. Um, obviously, at, at an absolute edge case, if you have 10,000 students uh, attempting a question and you have a 0% fail rate, chances are the question is broken. Uh, second horizon that we looked at was difficulty. So they assigned a difficulty level. The author assigned, look, this is an easy, medium, hard, or a 1 to 10 scale, whatever you're having. Um, it's really, yeah, oh, five? Oh, jeez. OK, I better hurry it up. <laughs> right, eggs. No. Uh, so um, it's incredibly important for two reasons that we have an accurate measure of the difficulty of questions. Number one, question sequencing. If we are giving a weak student really hard questions all the time, then they're going to become anxious, right? So we need to make sure that we have an accurate measure of the difficulty so we can make recommendations in a question sequencing algorithm to bring them on the journey. They fail one, they get another easy one, they pass it, they move slightly up the chain. So the question sequencing algorithm is important. And also we use IRT. Um, basically, you get more credit for passing a hard question than an easy question, right? pretty obvious, uh, but if we don't know the difficulty levels of our questions, we're really in trouble. So we interrogated it and found uh, the following uh, lacks of convergence or, or divergence. So in here, you'll see kind of a copy of the report that we sent to them. The original difficulty label, the updated label, green is where they were, broadly speaking, congruent. Uh, orange is where there was a difference of factor one, red difference of factor two. So what that means is, the actual lived student experience of these questions is totally different to what the author has suggested. The author has said that this is easy. We've analyzed the data. It is incredibly hard. So again, that's another area for the editorial team to interrogate to improve the quality of the product. 38% uh, of the content required adjustments to the metadata. Last uh, and not least, and, and also very quickly, uh, learning paths. So, I said previously that students go through a journey along a curriculum, right? So how on earth are we going to optimize this? Um, we talk a little bit about prerequisite relationships. So if a student performs well on 10 plus 10, or addition of double-digit integers, uh, we have evidence that they're likely going to nail single-digit integers, right? Because if you can add 13 and 15, you can probably add 2 and 2. Uh, conversely, uh, if you fail double-digit integers, probably not ready for triple-digit integer addition. So this is the fundamental way in which concepts are linked to each other within adaptive learning. Um, this is a map uh, of uh, one of our products in the market in, uh, in Ireland for algebra. And um, what this does is it plots out the optimal route for the student to journey through the product and also empowers our recommendations. So if a student is uh, underperforming in one of these nodes, we would look back to the prerequisites to identify a knowledge gap. What are they missing? All the kids who fail this concept, what are the other concepts that they all failed? What is the relationship, the prerequisite relationship between all these concepts? Um, and we were able to give a recommendation back to the publisher saying, look, this is how you should be intelligently structuring your content. Um, OK, two minutes. Bang on. Uh, so quick recap. Uh, we interrogated the data across uh, quality issues, uh, also difficulty metadata, extremely important if you want to have um, predictive analytics about performance of student behavior. Uh, if you have poor quality content, or you have mislabeled content, you really can't predict how a student will perform. If you can't predict how a student will perform, you won't be able to ensure that they're at the edge of their abilities, right? Those are the building blocks. And then the optimal learning path, as I said, ensuring that you don't waste people's time. If they know a concept, if you have evidence that they understand something, do not send them backwards to a prerequisite. They will get bored, they will switch off, and you will lose your users. Um, if you're fortunate enough to be partnering with Adaptomy in the near future, you'll be able to access all of this data from our handy dashboard.
And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, any questions? Well, that's a pretty thorough presentation. There is a question right there. Okay, yep, go ahead. Um, sorry if you said this. But, no. um, um, so when you're working with publishers, are they creating all new content or are people repurposing textbook content, repurposing existing assets into your system? We do both, right? So uh, it's rarely the case that a publisher, this Chinese publisher was kind of a dream come true because they'd already structured all the content so beautifully that we could map it very simply. The way we normally, this is a consultancy, kind of a side gig I thought you guys might find interesting. The way that we normally work with them is we go through the content creation process and we can retrofit existing platforms and existing content. But again, uh, there's, it, there's a transformative journey. You have to iterate there. Uh, they won't necessarily plug in exactly, but that's kind of part of the journey. Uh, were you ever approached by people in um, uh, university level or um, you know third level education to uh, experiment on the learning path, for example, from uh, PhD students? Because then the path is more based on uh, published literature, which would be relevant to people in this room. Ah, okay. Uh, so we are predominantly focused in the K twelve uh, sector. So. Part of the reason for that is, as I was saying earlier, the DNA of the company is really in that, um, that messy classroom dynamic between teachers and students and devices in the classroom. We have a huge kind of body of expertise in that. So consulting with partners to build products that work in K-12 is really our wheelhouse. Um, you could see quite readily how it could be extended to third level, but that's not where we are right now. Brilliant, thank you very much. Can we give sure. another round of applause to Daniel, please?